Uh, our second presentation today, or I guess third, if you count the deans, of course, uh, Mrs. Susan Cook Thanis is going to talk to us about uh, teaching abroad as an important way of reaching the world with friendship for peace. She is a, she's got three degrees from the Extension School, uh, an AE in uh, 1971, ABE in 74, and ALM in 1987. She is a retired English teacher from Duxbury, Massachusetts, and has taught as an AFS teacher in Russia, and directed four choral exchanges with Russia and the USSR. She's particularly interested in helping people of different cultures learn about one another. And she has hosted and mentored teachers and students from China, Thailand, Switzerland, and Korea. She taught, te she taught students in Shanghai, uh, in uh, Hefei, no, sorry for that pronunciation. In 2004, she co-founded the Sino-American Bridge for Education and Health and has taught tiny Chinese teachers several summers in Beijing uh, and throughout China. She's also the proud mother of four sons and three daughters-in-law and a grandmother of four granddaughters and two grandsons. And without further ado, Mrs. Susan Cook Venice. Здравствуйте. Now, hello. Hi, I'm just uh, wanted to um, have you be my students, if you would be, for part of the time, the very beginning and the very end of trying to make it in 10 minutes. And so you're getting some sheets. I'd like you to take the plain one, the other one, put it underneath. That's for later. And um, I'm going to share with you some of, um, some of my experiences. I became a love of travel, began loving to travel when I left Smith College after two years to go, in the, to, go to Germany with my husband in the Army. And I began my love of teaching as, an, in, as a water safety instructor for my town, and then said, hey, this is kind of fun. And so I began to teach. And I was an English teacher of my town for 31 years. Before, beginning, before traveling to China, having been an AFS teacher in, in Russia, I had a teacher from China come as an AFS teacher and live with me. And I began to study about China finally went to China and um, with a man who had been one of the guides, um, formed an organization called the Sino-American Bridge for Education and Health, which um, currently I'm chairman of. And uh, we, take, we take American teachers to China in the summertime to teach American methods to Chinese teachers. So that's a little bit about that. Now, I'm going to try to work this out. So. Um, this is one of this is from the students that I had last year, or were in the class that I was um, with. So teaching abroad can be an exceptional experience for American teachers. What do American teachers share with teachers in a foreign land? Well, one thing is the varied methods of education that can make students more excited about learning and able to think more abstractly outside the box. And um, that's what our Chinese teachers, I was teaching in Russia back in 1988, which was a very exciting time. But the last 10 years, I've been going back and forth to China. So most of my experiences are with that. And in China, well, let's first take a look at what has been the traditional way of teaching in China for centuries, lecture and note taking. So I'm going to ask you to take the blank piece of paper. And if you have a pen or a pencil, I'm going to, um, I'm going to give you a little lecture. Those of you who can. OK. This Sorry. <laughs> At the end, I'm going to let you vote which is the better method. This is a Langston Hughes lecture. Langston Hughes was born in Joplin, Missouri, the second child of school teacher Carrie Mercer Langston and James Nathaniel Hughes. He grew up in a series of Midwestern small towns. His father left the family and later divorced his wife. While his mother was looking for employment, Hughes was raised by his maternal grandmother, Mary Patterson Langston in Lawrence, Kansas, who distilled in her grandson a lasting sense of racial pride. 
after his grandmother died, he discovered the world of books, and during high school in Cleveland, he wrote for the school newspaper, edited the yearbook, and began to write his first short stories, poetry, and dramatic plays. During his life, he wrote many poems, among which Dream Deferred, also known as Harlem, is one of his best known. I shall read the poem for you and give you a copy to be discussed later. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? Or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? In the poem, Hughes is questioning what becomes of a dream that is delayed, tossed aside, or thwarted by external forces. Blacks in America had few opportunities to pursue these dreams during the era when Hughes wrote the poem. It may well have helped inspire the central metaphor of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Okay, that's one method. So please save the paper with the one with the printing for the end. Now let's take a look at some of the advantages for American teachers who teach in foreign lands. And this you can, you don't have to be writing anything for this. But I'd like to have you so think what you see what you think. This is a very, you've probably seen this, uh, how you identify an elephant. So what do you think um, is one of the advantages for American teachers who teach abroad that you can see from this American elephant? It's a wall if you're touching the side. It's a spear if you're touching the tusk. It's a fan if you're touching his ear. Everybody's blindfolded and trying to decide what an elephant is all about. Well, what it teaches someone who is going to teach abroad is that learning that there are multiple legitimate perspectives of subjects for which before it was assumed there could be only one. We really, we really don't have the same experiences here as you get when you travel abroad, and that, it, that is one of the things that is a benefit. Another one, getting out of one's comfort zone and being forced to interact in a foreign culture makes one reappraise his or her viewpoints, a very healthy thing to do, related to the first one. Okay, what are some viewpoints that you'd have to alter a little bit from these two pictures? Who's this? Basketball. Yao Ming. Yao Ming. Yao Ming, right. What did you think about Chinese people before you ever saw like Yao Ming? They were short. They very short. That everybody in China is very short. Not true. They're eating their Wheaties and they're growing tall. And it's, well, not everyone is as tall as Yao Ming. How about this one? Did you notice his pants? Oh, right. Toilet training is different. They, in China, the little children who are being trained wear split pants. And when there's a need to pee, well, take them over to the side of the road and let them pee. And it's just the way that training is done there. And of course, we'd have to alter our ideas about it, adjust our ideas, because we keep you know, baby, babies and paper products until all the paper products run out, or they learn how to, to be trained. A third advantage is, depending upon where one is, she, I'm going to use that she instead of he, could experience what it is like to be a minority, especially a racial minority. I have a friend who was in the, on my board who was in the Peace Corps back in the 70s, and she was telling me a story about um, one day when she left the town to visit the capital, and she was one of only two volunteers in the town. After not having left for over a month and came upon a white man walking along the side of the road, he thought she was ill and about to faint until she realized that after seeing a few other white people that in her eyes, she was so accustomed to seeing black and brown skin that white skin seemed incredibly pale and sick. So um, finding out what it's like to be a minority could be one of the things. It's an advantage. Another is that learning to explore, navigate, and flourish in a different culture gives a teacher uh, a great confidence, especially in her ability to adapt to new situations and find solutions to problems. The teacher in the top photo was one of, who went with me last summer uh, to Hangzhou. And at the beginning of the week, she was teaching. She was, we had teachers from all around the United States. Um, she was from Washington. And she began to group teachers in traditional methods. And we said, no, you really should try putting them in groups. And these teachers were science teachers who don't speak English. 
So she was going to teach them with the aid of American, of, excuse me, of English teachers, um, what new methods that they could use to teach science. And she had some great success. At the end of the week, there's one of her teachers using one of, one of the methods that she taught, to, to, uh, one of the science teachers who was teaching the other science teachers. One learns about a culture by participating, seeing it in action, and visiting historic places one has only read about. That's one of the very best things about going over to teach. Here's one of Westlake and Hangzhou. And on the back of the, the UN note, this is the one UN note. That's a scene in Westlake. These scenes are from um, down near Guilin, uh, rice fields. Here, of course, is Shanghai, and Shanghai has wonderful museums where you can see furniture and scrolls. And I always wondered with the scrolls where the rounded mountains had come from. How did people happen to see those round mountains? And on my trip last summer, Guilin, I, we were taken to Guilin, and I saw those rounded mountains on the Li River and also found that there was a scene from the back of the 20 Yuan note. So we have other, other advantages, gaining an understanding of child rearing practices um, and developing personal friendships, especially with teacher colleagues, with students, with neighbors and others one, has, one meets. And for re returning the, the um, appreciation to people who come from who have people we've taught in China before. And we, of course, they love to go to the ocean. They went to Plymouth Plantation, and they love to eat lobster. OK, having fun teaching one, one's own culture is also part of that. We had an opportunity to teach some baseball. OK, we also return with an appreciation not only of, our, of the other culture, but of our own. There are so many benefits that, if at all possible, I would suggest that preparation should include teaching abroad because one teacher can influence a great number of students. OK, some of the advantages for those whom American teachers teach abroad um, is to, just as American teachers are forced to reassess their own viewpoint concerning a foreign land, students must also reassess their preconceptions about Americans from these media, from others who've never been to America, because the view is that America is full of crime and or money, looking for money, and of course, that's one of the things that we can make them ass assess. OK, so we have um, many things that they can learn, um, expanding their education, having varied members of teaching, um, learning that praise is better than silent acknowledgment, having fun learning new activities, And sometimes there are problems, such as culture shock, people who may be a little too ethnocentric to think their culture is superior to others, they should stay home. Um, and there are some problems. Sometimes teaching abroad programs are not equal. Um, finances could be a problem. But in the, on the overall, the advantages outweigh the problems. And this is the group of students from last summer in Hangzhou. So let's go back and take a quick look. I'm not going to be able to do everything with you, but I'd like you to take that other piece of paper, fold it into pieces, excuse me, fold it in half, and in half again, and open it to the side that has these four parts. Now, we don't have time to do this, but um, first of all, I'm just going to, what do I do? I'm going to, I'm going to, how do I do this? Introduce. I want to hit the. How do I hit this? Get this to play. Is there something to play? Yeah, there's a place. Oh. Yeah. yeah, there it is. Okay, I just want to be a little short. Here's Langston Hughes reading his own poem. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? That was the author himself. Now, if we had more time and this were a regular classroom. OK. I would um, 
ask you to look at the poem and uh, look for keywords, images, what feelings that Hughes gives, and the ideas conveyed. And then there'd be a discussion with, with, a, with a partner next to you um, and discovering a lot more than if it's just the teacher telling you what the poem is all about. And then, then one of the other things you can do is you turn it over, is you can do mirror writing. Mirror writing is a creative strategy that uses the same form but a different contrast feelings. And so using the same poem, you can say what happens to a dream fulfilled. And here's one that, that a Chinese teacher wrote, Amy, in class six. Does it appear as splendid as heaven to me or just an old house to live in? Maybe east or west, home is best. Does it taste like a banquet dinner or a simple picnic? Maybe the taste of food is not so delicious but please think of someone who has nothing to eat. Does it look like the colorful rainbow whenever a good rain washes the world? Maybe it is just as the sunset only, destined to be a memory forever. Sort of typically Chinese in the response to writing a dream fulfilled. So a teacher can have a lasting effect on many as overlapping ripples, you meet other people, and I thank you for being great students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have a few minutes for questions. First. You didn't have a chance to try that last. I, I was hoping you'd say you'd like to learn the latter instead oh, so, um, of the former. Yeah, right I've always wondered, is it possible well, to learn just, Chinese as an adult? Yes. Sorry. Stay close oh, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, just, just stay close. Okay. Um, yes, it's possible to learn Chinese as an adult. It's, it's more difficult the older you are. I started in my 60s, and it's really been a challenge. But um, the characters are difficult to remember. But speaking is, uh, can be learned more, you know, if you have some, some good CDs or something. Yes? How young are the teachers that you have there that you interact The teachers with? that go have to have uh, three years' experience teaching in, in the United States. And they apply, and we interview them, and we, um, we try to match them up with the, right, the programs that we have there. We have a program in Hangzhou teaching, well, this year, Again, we'll be teaching other teachers, not English teachers, but teachers of science, social studies, and math, studies in math. And then in, in Fujo, we have about 16 teachers going to teach in a teacher's institute, and they're teaching teachers of English. And do these teachers come from around the country? Or? Yes, they come. We, we've started with only around the, Mass the Boston area, but we now have countries, because with, with um, Skype, we can interview them and have them come and meet rather than come to meet. Yes. How are you funded? Well, we're a volunteer, or completely volunteer, nonprofit organization, and that's one of the things that we we're we're looking into. We actually believe in it so much ourselves that we um, we each donate at least two hundred and fifty dollars a year. Those of us on the board to keep it running, and the the teachers go. They're volunteers. They pay their own airfare over, and they're reimbursed half of it by the school that they are visiting. Um, but there are other expenses, obviously, that need to be paid for. Where, where do they live? There. They do live they in, in their there? own. They live in in the school or in a hotel that the school provides. Uh, they each have their own air conditioned classroom, air conditioned room, bedroom, except. And then they're given a week of travel um, that uh, around China by the school that hosts them. Now that's my that's the organization that I'm talking about that I've gone with. I have gone with other experience other. Um, places for teaching too, but it, I'd like to. I just want the not necessarily the organization I'm chairman of, but just the idea of teaching abroad. And if any of you are thinking of becoming teachers or are teachers and would like to go, there are, as we've seen on some of the other programs, there are other opportunities. And to think about it, because it's a, it's a wonderful, mind enriching, expanding um, experience. How much of a time commitment do the students? Well, for the, the summer program that I that I'm in charge, that I have, it's, a, it's about four or five weeks in the summer. The other one I was on two years ago was 10 months. I was teaching in Hefei, China at that time. 
Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, what has been your favorite part with doing this work, and what has been personally the greatest challenge you've run into? <sighs> Well, the greatest part, I think, is seeing the response of the teachers and the students. We teach students, too. And, they're, uh, and when they finish their program, they're, they're so excited. There's such enthusiasm. That that's, that's what I think is the, be the greatest part. I guess the, the most difficult part is um, trying to figure out funding, and we don't have, really have a person who is able to um, write grants and things like that. So probably that's the most difficult thing. But I, it's something that I really wholeheartedly believe is worthwhile. Any other questions out there? Yes. Are you still in contact with any of your former students? Yes, I am. Actually, the first year, actually, not my first year, but the second year that I went um, in, in Fujo, and I have visited them two years ago when I was teaching on a different program. Um, they invited me down, one for uh, a weekend to, to where he was on the outside of near Fujian, the end of Fujian province, and the other one to visit in her father's little or her hometown, which is a little fishing village, and for the New Year's, and I wanted the Chinese, so I had a Chinese New Year's in a little fishing village, which was wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.